He said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays towards this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, so that they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you are the author of our faith. Engrave on our hearts the gospel revealed in Jesus Christ and brought near to us by your Holy Spirit, that we may attest to this faith in lives that are pleasing to you. We are thankful to gather this day. Let us hear your word so that we may go out and live and love as you have us do. We remember Mandy Ashley and Winfrey Whitaker this day recovering from surgeries, Linda Helms Thompson and the death of her mother. We continue to remember Janet and remember all those that are suffering, not mentioned today, that need the comfort that only you can provide. We lift them up to you. On this Memorial Day weekend, remember those who have died and given everything they have to defend our freedom. We lift up their families and loved ones to you that are still grieving from so long ago or in recent times. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't, I don't know what I did, but I did it. <laughs> wow, I mean, that happened this morning, and I was all, all I was speechless. I mean, then all of a sudden, I went down radio silence, so maybe it'll stay this day. Our children, they'll come forward. Uh, Turner Zambecki is actually doing the children's time next week, but I'll be happy to have a time with all of our children right now. They'll come forward. Good morning. How's everybody? We celebrate things, don't we? What are some of the things we celebrate? Christmas. Christmas. Yeah, that's a neat thing to celebrate. And we do celebrate Easter. What else we celebrate? Birthdays. My birthday was on Easter. Was your birthday on Easter? Well, happy birthday on Easter. That is wonderful. What else we celebrate? We celebrate wedding anniversaries. You know that? Hey, I know somebody had a wedding anniversary yesterday. And you know how many years they've been married? Not five, not 10, not 20, not 30, not 40, not 50, not 60, 61 years. Isn't that neat? You know who they are? Wanda Ritchie. And Archibald. <laughs> so we got to celebrate that, don't you think? Isn't that wonderful? So we celebrate anniversaries, we celebrate birthdays, we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate Easter. In a couple of weeks, you're going to celebrate being out of school? Yeah. You're not going to be happy about that, are you? We're going to celebrate summer. And what are we celebrating today and this weekend? Memorial Day. Wow, that's a neat thing to celebrate. You know why we celebrate Memorial Day? That's right. We celebrate the people in the military who have died in the, uh, for their country. And you know how it started? It started by some women who saw the carnage of the Civil War. The Civil War was a long time ago in the 1860s when our country was fighting against each other and it was a horrible thing and people, a lot of people died. And these women said, you know, we've got to remember that and we've got to remember how terrible it was and we've got to remember all the sacrifices that had been made. And so they began to celebrate Memorial Day and we still celebrate Memorial Day. We remember everyone, just like you said, 
everyone who has fought, everyone who has died, everyone has given everything they had. And that makes a very important holiday, don't you think? It makes us glad and we're thankful that we live in a country where you're free to go to school, where you're free to be yourself, where you're able to, where we're free to come together and worship. A lot of people in a lot of places have given everything they had to make that possible. So we will celebrate that today, and we'll remember it, and we'll remember all those other happy occasions, and we'll remember how in the world they wanted to put up with Archie for 61 years. Can you imagine? Wow. All right, will you, will you pray after me? Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for so many people who have given so much that we are able to enjoy and have the freedoms that we do. We remember people all over the world who are our brothers and our sisters. Help us to be good neighbors and help us to celebrate all these wonderful occasions. Amen. All right. Good to see you guys. Our offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 337. I know whom I have believed. Let's stand again as we sing, please. Hymn 337.
join me in prayer? Most gracious, kind, and loving Heavenly Father, whose mighty hand created the heavens and the earth, and all that is in and all that is on, who blesses us beyond anything we can imagine, whose love and compassion is beyond anything we can possibly know. O oh Lord, we come before you this day, humbled and in awe at the many blessings you provided. And we bring back a portion of that which you gave us to offer in spreading your word throughout all the world. We offer our prayer today in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, who died for our sins. Amen. <laughs>
day by day and with each passing moment strength I find to meet my trials here trusting in my father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear he whose heart is kind beyond all measure Gives unto each day what he deems best Lovingly it's part of pain and pleasure Mingling toil with peace and Every day the Lord himself is with me With a special mercy for each hour All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me He whose name is Counselor and Power the protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. As thy days, thy strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me he made. Help me then in every tribulation So to trust thy promises, O Lord That I lose not faith's sweet consolation Offered me within thy holy word Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, there to take as from a father's hand one by one the moment's days are fleeting till I reach the promised land. Always so very beautiful. Steve and Robin survived the Joy Club at their house. It sounded like a wonderful time. Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from Luke. I'm trying to be very still. <laughs> After Jesus had finished all of his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly, and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slaves. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, he is worthy of you to do, he is worthy of having you do this for him. For he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them, and when he was not far from the house of the centurion, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. But not only speak the word and let my servant be healed, for I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, 
And he comes, and my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word, and may we know the truth of that word deep in all of our lives. We do celebrate Memorial Day this week. There is a photograph in my office of, of my grandmother and my great uncle and another one of my great aunts in front of a house in East Bend. There is a mule there, and they're all dressed up because they're going to ride the mule to go to church. It's a very special photograph of me. Was it something I said? <laughs> Pardon our delay. All right, I'm going to try again. All right, I'm not going to walk around. Just cut me off. All right, we good? If I wander over there by habit, forgive me, or that way by habit. Anyway, the picture is very meaningful. Uh, first of all, it reminds me of my great-grandfather. And this house behind there burned down and... Um, Actually, Jim Wilhelm, my teacher in high school and also at governor's school, uh, remember my grandfather, and he said he remembered his dad telling him that when that house burned down, uh, my, grand, my great-grandfather said, it's just a house, we'll build another one. And they went ahead and they built another one. But um, I would go up to his place. Mainly, I remember him giving me candy. What, what child doesn't remember the great-grandfather, grandfather giving them candy? Uh, but I would go fishing on a pond in East Bend at this place. And over the years, I, I, I kept wondering why there were so many junk cars. I mean, I thought, well, were we poor white trash? And why are all these junky cars uh, in this beautiful lake, you know, a pond? It's not a lake, it's a pond. Uh, really good bass, really good brim. Uh, but they were just there, and all the kinds of pieces of farm implements that were just rusty. And finally, I asked my mother, I said, why, uh, why did you let all this happen? Because uh, it's just rotting and rusting, and it looks bad. And they said the story was of my, uh, he's not in the picture because he wasn't born yet, but the youngest part of the family, Eddie. Eddie was a pilot in the Second World War, and he was shot down uh, by, a ja by the Japanese and, and died. When my grandfather heard that, it, uh, of course, as any father, I mean, it devastated him. Uh, but he swore that there would never be any metal leaving the farm. Uh, because uh, before the war, we had sold uh, sheet metal and scrap metal uh, to Japan. And he said, it'll never happen again. Uh, he will not be a part of that. Uh, we, we remember and our memory has consequences and actions. And uh, so a little smart aleck kid like myself didn't understand the, the depth and the hurt and the anguish of that. But on Memorial Day, we remember, Veterans Day, we salute our veterans, but Memorial Day, we remember those who died, those who paid the ultimate price. And we also remember all the innocent victims on both sides and every side of war. So let's pause for a moment just to remember. Our Father, we remember. We remember so many in so many different places 
who have given everything that they have had. We remember so many others, so many innocent victims even today who understand too well the ruthlessness and the carnage of war. We pray for peace. We pray for hope. We pray for courage. But we remember. And in remembering, our lives are changed. Our world is different. We remember the cost. And as we've gathered this day together, we remember those who are sick, those who are hurting, those who are lonely. We remember that you have called us to be in this world and we have called us to be your ministers, one in each and every one. That you have given us a purpose, a task, and you've given us the authority to do it. You've given us the gifts and the abilities to be who we need to be. Oh, Lord, forgive us when we think we need to be someone else. Help us to be truly the gifted person that you have made us. And so in these moments as we come together, we pray for forgiveness. Forgiveness for opportunities that we have squandered. Forgiveness when we have fallen so short of what you would have us to be. Forgiveness when we have not been peacemakers. Forgiveness when we have thought only of ourselves. We are thankful and grateful. Even as we have come to your throne of grace, that there is grace. And that your grace is greater than our sins. And your forgiveness is felt. And so in this day, we come to remember how you once taught us to pray, how thankful we are that you have come into our world, that you're a part of our world. And so we remember and we pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In everything in the New Testament, or any in the old too, geography is important. Where Jesus is, what he is doing where he is, it's all important. And so the scripture immediately tells us after Jesus had finished all of his saying in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Capernaum is the place of miracles. Capernaum is, is where he healed Peter's mother-in-law. Capernaum is where he touched people. Capernaum is where great things have happened. There has been healing. There has been all kinds of things that have occurred. I not realized it until this week that Paul never mentions the miracles of Jesus. Paul never mentions them. They're not mentioned. There's only one miracle that Paul mentions, and that is the resurrection. Which, by the way, if you're going to mention a miracle, that's a good one to mention. But there's probably a reason for that. Paul is concerned with the risen Lord because Paul has met the risen Lord. Paul never knew the earthly Jesus. Paul never knew him as the human that he was. Paul never understood those things. And so as, as Paul develops his theology and everything, else, but the gospel writers want us to know something more. They want us to know the Jesus who dwelt in flesh. The Jesus who touched people, the Jesus who healed people, the Jesus who performed miracles, miracles of love, miracles of life, miracles of faith. And when Jesus performed a miracle, he usually touched someone or someone touched him. The woman come and touched the hem of his cloak and he said, who touched me? And the, the wonder of that is the disciples looked around and said, what do you mean who touched you? You're in a crowd. We all touched you. But he knew. 
the, the, the Jesus who would touch the leper, the Jesus who would extend his hand, the Jesus who would tell uh, the paralytic to stand up and walk. These are all the miracles that we know. So Jesus is coming in to Capernaum. So we would expect a miracle. We would be aware that a miracle is going to happen. Something marvelous is going to happen here in this place. But it is a strange story. And the miracle may not be the miracle that we expect. The miracle here is not necessarily that a slave was healed. The miracle here goes far deeper than that. It's Jesus who looks at, uh, well, he doesn't look at the centurion, but he marvels at the centurion's faith and says, such great faith I have not seen in Israel. What is going on here? First of all, we have a complex community. We all live in community. We, we live together. It's just like your family. Whether you like some of them or not, it's still your family. It just is, you know, it's just the way it is. And we live as a family one way or the other. We live in community, and that community is important. That community influences, that community changes us, that community changes the way we look at things. Jesus is talking about community. And in this community, there are complex relationships. We also see the juxtaposition once more, as Luke is ever apt to do. The gospel writer never keeps us far from understanding that there is Caesar and there is Jesus. And somewhere you have to decide who you're really going to follow. And that is part of what is going on here. Interesting enough. As Jesus has done these things, uh, there is a centurion that had a slave that he valued highly. He was ill. He was close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to Jesus, asking him to come and heal the slave. Now, how would you like to be the Jewish leaders? He's thinking about being caught between a rock and a hard place. Here is this centurion who is the epitome of power and might and strength who represents without a doubt Rome and the emperor. And he asked these Jewish leaders, can you guys do me a favor here? I've got this slave who is near death. I've heard about this Jesus. Can you tell him to heal him? So when they come to Jesus, they appeal to him, and they say it in such a way, they appeal to him earnestly. I think that is a rich and deep word. He is worthy of you having doing this for him. They're saying, Jesus, we need you to do this. If you don't mind, if you could just do it, it would help us a lot. And then they tell him why. He loves our people. He has built our synagogue for us. Now, of all the things that we would expect in that day and that time, this is not one of them. You see, life is always much more complex than we would have it. Life has so many different shades of gray and color and hues and, and everything else than we ever can imagine. We, we, we like to characterize people. We, we would like everything to be black and white, this and that, and everything's fine. But life will not let us be that way. This Roman centurion, who is the bad guy. He has a slave. He has the soldiers. He can do all the things he wants. It turns out he's much more complex than that. It turns out he has compassion, or at least he has political savvy. It turns out that he recognizes that if he's going to be in this land, in this occupied land, that he has to do certain things, or he doesn't have to do them, but he wants to do them to engender a different kind of relationship. So he gets to know the people. 
What a marvelous idea. Isn't it always better when we get to know somebody? Isn't it always better when we can have supper or a dinner with somebody? Is it always better when we can have a glass of tea with somebody? Is it always better when we can just sit down and talk with somebody? He gets to know and respect these people. And he builds them a synagogue. We don't know what his faith is. He's a Roman. He's a centurion. But he respects the people enough that he wants to do something for them. And now he has a problem. And he says, can you help me out? Now that sounds pretty tit for tat, quid pro quo. It sounds like a, a really, you know, let's do it. But it goes deeper, I think. He has understood something about the events of the day that are happening. They are complex. They are about relationships. They're about building relationships. Our problem is we're too fast to destroy a relationship. We're too fast to do a relationship in than to build it. He is about building community. Now, the community may never be the, exactly the way we want it. This is certainly not an idealistic community that we find. We still have a centurion that represents Rome. We still have a slave that is sick. It's not a great ideal community. But it is a community which Jesus enters. And as Jesus enters that community, he goes to the centurion home. He heads toward the home and they go with him. But the centurion sends people out and says, no, this is not what I meant. You don't have to do this. I didn't bother to come see you. You don't have to bother to my house. I'm a man of authority. When I say something, people do it. He obviously wasn't a parent. He was a man of authority. He says, when I tell them, they will do it. When I ask, they will go. All of these things happen at my voice. And he says, you, you are a man of authority. Say that he will be healed and he will be healed. And Jesus turns and he says, I have not seen such faith in all of Israel. I think it goes deeper than that. It is reminding us in the community in which we are, what do we do and how do we do it and whose authority do we observe? Do we recognize the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Do we recognize the authority that he has done by his integrity? It says throughout the Gospels that he spoke with authority. He taught with authority. It is authority of the integrity of his living. This is the authority that he has. What authority do you have? We didn't issue you all badges and say, I'm from a guild church and by the authority vested in me. That's going to do a lot of good. I don't even say by the authority vested in me by the state at any wedding because I don't believe in the authority vested in the state by any wedding to start with. That's not a state matter. What authority? Do you have and where does it come from? Jesus has the authority that comes from the living of who he is. The living out of his life. The living out of the way he was created. How he is created. Who he is. His mission. His task. His purpose. Your authority is the same. When you discover who you truly are. When you discover what it is that God would have for you. When you discover who you're going to serve. Bob Dylan, who is a pretty good theologian. Depending wrote a song a long time ago that said, you're going to serve somebody. You're going to serve somebody. Who are you going to serve? That's the question. Whose authority are you going to recognize when you understand the authority that God has in your life? And then it's just a simple authority of discovering who you really are. How have you been created? You've been created in the image of God. What is it you need to do? You need to live up to that image. You need to live up to your purpose. You need to live up to your being. You need to live up. And in living that up, you will find the authority of life.
You don't have to be anybody else. You don't have to worry about anybody else's authority in that sense. It is your life. And as you live it under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, as you live it in such a way that is pleasing to him, your faith, your love, and your life will be enriched. Who are you going to serve? Whose authority do you recognize? And when you discover that God is the creator of all, and you are a part of that creation, and that there is a purpose and a path for you in that creation, then my, what more authority do you need? Live the life that God would have you to live. May we pray. Our Father, we are grateful and thankful that you have given us life, that you have given us purpose, that you have given us task. Oh, Lord, help us to understand the authority in our life. For you are the author of our life. And you have all authority. Open our hearts. Open our lives. Open our minds. In your name we do pray. Amen. Our hymn is hymn number 613, the servant song. A beautiful song of serving and being and knowing the true authority of life. We invite you to know the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We invite you to know his love in your life and to share that love. We invite you to be part of our fellowship, our membership here at McGill as we stand and sing hymn number 613. If you're visiting with us, you'll be back.
and be a part. One thing, uh, we've lost a Bible. Carol Miller, as a Bible is missing. We have a Bible missing in action. And if you think it's got her name on it, it's a brown Bible, and it's very, very uh, important to her. So if you, just, if you look around the church, if, you, uh, if you've taken it by mistake, uh, or if you just know where it is, uh, help Carol out. And uh, well, it's here somewhere, and we're going to find it. So help us out. Uh, any, anything else? We're good? No choir rehearsal this Wednesday. No choir rehearsal this Wednesday. All right. We rehearse again on the 12th. You, you're you're so safe to... 40th anniversary choir rehearsal. I like that. Well, when you get to 61, tell, tell me about it. Well, I know, yeah, yeah. I hope I do. Steve got a haircut. I'm really loud now. So, uh, Steve got a haircut for the uh, directory. You look good. Robin made him. I can only say impressive. <laughs> we have fun at McGill. And now we go into this world, the world that God has created, the God that who is the author of all life, and in him all authority rests. Go and know that authority. Go and serve that authority. Go and be who you need to be. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.